This video continues the discussions on the basic steady state principles for a transformer isolated DC DC converters and the specific topic for this video is this requirement on flex continuity. In some of the previous videos we learned that um, um, for the transformer isolated converters uh, they need to meet these three additional requirements in addition to the conditions needed for the non-isolated converters. So we already learned the equal volts per turn and the volt second balance for the transformer windings and uh, the focus of this video is the flex continuity in the transformer core. Okay, so the statement of the flex continuity rule is, uh, is very simple. Uh, it just simply states that the flex in the core of the transformer cannot have discontinuity or the flex needs to be continuous. There cannot be step changes in the in the net flex in the core. Okay? So why is that? If you look at uh, Faraday's law, which gives the relationship between the flex in the core and the voltage of any of the windings, it is N d phi over dt is uh, the applied voltage V of t, where phi is the flex in the core. Okay? So therefore, uh, for a step change, it would mean that the step change in the flex would mean that the d phi over dt is either um, a positive infinity or negative infinity, which would require the voltage to be positive or negative infinity, and uh, that is not uh, possible. So it's certainly not a valid circuit, which requires infinite voltages. So, so that's the key requirement. So when we design uh, various uh, circuit uh, topologies and um, control methods, we should ensure that uh, we always have this rule satisfied. The flex uh, does not require to have step changes. Okay? But if you do create a situation by your switching action, uh, which results in uh, the flex um, you know, having to fall abruptly, then that would uh, result in very large voltage spikes and um, um, most likely killing the, uh, the MOSFETs and other switches and other components. Now, in the case of a single winding inductor, like the ones that we studied in uh, non-isolated converters, the flex continuity is, uh, uh, is actually synonymous with inductor current continuity. Uh, or the flex continuity requirement is equivalent to requiring the inductor current to be continuous in the case of the single winding inductor. Okay. So the reason is, uh, you know, in the in the in the single winding inductor, the flex phi in the core is given by uh, the flex is MMF over the reluctance. Reluctance. Uh, that's reluctance. Okay. So MMF is uh, the number of turns in or n one times the inductor current IL over the reluctance. So that is the uh, that's a flex. Okay. So if um, IL is continuous, then these two being constant, phi will also be continuous. So so these two requirements are synonymous, flex continuity and inductor current continuity. Okay. But in the case of um, um, in the case of uh, multiple winding uh, inductors or transformers, then the flex is uh, not uh, decided just by one current, but it is decided by the combination of all the winding currents. Okay. So I should have probably retained my previous uh, equation. But in the case of multiple winding transformers, phi uh, is also mm for reluctance, but there will be n1 times i1 plus n2 times i2 and so on up to say there are m windings at nm times im, all of them having the uh, divided by the same reluctance r. Okay. So clearly you can see that um, it is the um, some, some combination of these current uh, decides the flex, therefore some combination of these currents needs, needs to be continuous to have the flex to be continuous. So that is uh, a key uh, key point to understand for multiple winding transformers or inductors. It is the combined flex, not the flex due to any any single current. It is the combined flex in the core or the net flex in the core that needs to be continuous. Okay? So as I said, this is a key point and um, this will become very uh, useful um, in analyzing various uh, isolated converters of many different types. Next, uh, let me show some um, valid as well as invalid waveforms for the flex in the core. Okay? So all the waveforms that I'm going to show on the left of this line, they uh, are valid waveforms for steady state of valid waveforms for flex for steady state operation of isolated converters. 
So first waveform is this um, uh, piecewise linear uh, waveform, which we have seen uh, several times in the non-isolated converters as the waveform of, a, of an inductive current. Okay. So the, and it's also the waveform of the inductive flex for the single winding inductor. And that waveform is certainly valid for isolated converters as the flex waveform as well. Okay. So if you look at the voltage that creates this flex, it would be a positive value when the flex is rising and a negative value when the flex is falling, but always a finite value. It's never, needs, it's never needed to be infinite for the voltage. Okay. So this is certainly a valid waveform. And we see this in um, um, several flyback converters and um, um, and um, in the case of a multiple winding inductors as well. Okay. Uh, a sinusoidal waveform for flex is uh, most certainly a valid waveform. Uh, the voltage that causes um, this uh, would also be a sinusoidal waveform in quadrature with the flux, with the flex waveform. Okay, so this is certainly valid. Uh, even though we don't see this in a traditional switch mode uh, power converters. Maybe some of the resonant converters may have at least a, uh, um, some kind of a quasi sine wave. The next waveform is, uh, is a DC waveform. Now, you may recall that um, in our previous video on volt second balance, we uh, studied that the voltage of a winding cannot be a DC uh, the voltage cannot have a DC average value. If it does, the flex would continuously keep rising and uh, that does not result in a valid steady state. But this is the waveform of the um, of the flex itself. Um, the, and, and the flex can have a DC waveform. Okay, so this is a valid waveform. Then the next set of waveforms that I'm going to show to the right of uh, this line, uh, those are invalid waveforms for flex. Uh, but I should uh, emphasize that they may be valid waveforms for individual winding current of the transformer. But for the net flex in the core, um, these are invalid waveforms. Okay? So the first one is uh, a square wave. So a square wave with this um, um, sharp transition positive to negative, negative to positive. That is not a valid waveform for the flex. That would require an infinite um, negative voltage here and infinite positive voltage here. Okay, so that is not valid. Similarly, this waveform is also not valid uh, during this rising portion here. So we need a positive voltage, so that is okay. But at this instant, the flex changes from a finite positive value to zero instantaneously. That would require a negative infinite voltage. So this also is not a valid waveform. Uh, but clearly, uh, especially this second waveform, and in some converters, the first one also, we would see them as um, um, a valid waveform for uh, one of the um, of the transformer winding currents. Okay? Uh, just that the flex would be supported by another set of winding when these large transitions occur in in this particular winding current. Now, to help with the um, um, uh, with the analysis in the later slides. Uh, let me quickly recap what we learned about um, the dot convention, especially the rule number two. It says that the currents that enter the dot in, uh, uh, in any of the windings, they produce flex that add in the core. So if the, the two currents here are entering, then the flex due to each of these currents, they add in the, in the core. Okay? Therefore, if phi1 is the flex created by I1 and phi2 is the flex created by I2, then uh, the net flex in the core uh, would be phi one plus phi one plus phi two. Okay. Similarly, for um, uh, this transformer dot configuration, uh, if I one um, enters the dot here and uh, I two actually leaves the dot here, it enters the end dot at the end, leaves the dot at the end, then the net flex would be phi one minus phi two. Okay. Uh, a similar situation here. Uh, here also, I one enters the dot, whereas I two leaves the dot. Therefore, the flex in the core is phi1 minus phi2. Okay? So it is important to remember that currents entering the dot or currents leaving the dot in all the windings, they um, produce a flex that add in the core. As a development towards uh, analyzing multiple winding transformers, let's uh, first look at the case of the uh, single winding inductor as, uh, as shown here. Okay? So I have this uh, a single winding on this ferrite core and I apply this voltage source through a switch to this winding. Okay? And this is the circuit uh, schematic representation of, uh, of the structure. Now, when the switch is turned on, we apply this voltage across the winding. 
uh, the, that causes a mantising current that builds up the flex in the core which is rising. Now when I turn off the switch, uh, obviously there is no current path, so the current um, comes instantaneously to zero. That would mean the flex would also tend to go from uh, a positive finite value to zero instantaneously. And that is not allowed. That violates the flex continuity. So that is, uh, so this is an invalid circuit. Okay? And if you do construct a circuit like this and turn off the switch, then that will result in an infinite voltage ideally. Um, if the switching transition is uh, instantaneous, then that will create this infinite voltage and will destroy the switch. Okay? So the bottom line is in a single winding inductor, you cannot uh, have um, a switch in directly in series with the winding. Uh, and uh, switch that at, uh, at high frequencies. Okay. However, in a two winding or a multiple winding transformer, we can have a situation where we connect a switch uh, directly in series with uh, any one of the windings and that is still a valid circuit. And that is because it is the flex in the core, the net flex in the core that needs to be continuous and not the individual winding currents. Okay. So that is uh, illustrated here. Uh, what I have on the left is the situation in the previous slide uh, and to that uh, I add a second winding with the associated switch and another voltage source and all of a sudden the circuit um, at least has the potential to be a valid circuit. Okay? Uh, I, I say potential because we still need to make sure that the dot polarity is correct and the, the direction of the diode is correct and so on. Okay? So, so let's go ahead and determine the dot polarity. Now a current that enters the winding here, we can see that it produces a flex going upwards or a flex in the clockwise direction in the core. Okay. Similarly, a current uh, with this winding direction, a current that enters the winding at this point, the I2 uh, with the associated uh, current uh, direction, would again um, produce a flex that goes downwards or also in the clockwise direction in the, in the core. Therefore, the uh, flex due to these two currents uh, with the assigned current directions, they produce a flex that add inside the core. Therefore, the dot uh, arrangement or the dot polarity would be as shown here. So if you place a dot on the top of the first finding, because the fact uh, that we just um, um, established that the flex is add, um, uh, the dot on the second binding would also be at the top. Now, um, now the addition of this second binding and the associated components, uh, the diode and the other voltage source, has the potential to make it a valid circuit, provided that the um, uh, the flex continuity in the in the core is maintained uh, whenever the the uh, the switch turns off and therefore uh, interrupting the primary current. So as long as the flex can be maintained uh, continuous by an instantaneous current in the secondary winding then this can be a valid circuit. So we will analyze um, this circuit along with a few other uh, related examples in the next video.